Last time you talked about electrochemical cells, and then I said that galvanic cells or slash voltaic cells have to be spontaneous, and that allows them to the chemistry to then produce electrical energy, while electrolytic cells are using electrical energy to drive chemical reactions. So that chemical reaction is non-spontaneous. And that all comes back down to thermodynamics. So remember from your chemistry classes, you have previously seen that if we have a reaction, let's say we're going A going to B, uh, we can think about the thermodynamics of this reaction, whether it's spontaneous or not, by drawing a reaction coordinate diagram. So let's say we have, this is our reaction coordinate. And then on this y-axis over here, we have energy. And then we think about the energies of A and B. And then let's say that we then draw some sort of pathway, the reaction pathway from A to B. So the pathway itself does not matter for thermodynamics. It's in fact just the energies of the starting material and the product that determine whether it's spontaneous or not. So if we just compare the overall free energy, so this is our delta G. And remember, delta G is free energy, so this is usually in units of kilojoules per mole. And then so whether delta G is less than zero or not, if delta G is less than zero, this reaction is spontaneous. So uh, we sometimes call this thermodynamically downhill. The same thing can apply to electrochemical reactions. So if we want to think about uh, electron transfer, we could think about having, let's say, here's electron in one state. So here's my electron. Very cute. And then we want to transfer it to a different state. So let's say, again, whatever pathway, we're not saying pathways yet. That, that's kinetics, so we'll talk about that later. So the electron hops over, and then we form our, you know, electron is now in a new state. So that's electron transfer, that's a redox reaction. And then so what kind of work this does has to then be thought about in terms of delta G, whether it's spontaneous or not. So the factors that matter are the number of electrons that are being transferred. And uh, in this case, this plot is going to be on, again, we have our x-axis as the reaction coordinate, which is some you know, invisible units. But here, rather than having energy, we could express this in terms of potential. So you all have seen this before in physics as in volts. And the reason because that we express this in terms of potential rather than in uh, energy units is because here we have energy units kilojoules per mole. If we know for every mole of A, we'll get a certain amount of energy as this reaction proceeds. For here, a redox reaction might transfer multiple electrons. We've seen those before where, let's say, zinc going to copper uh, transfers two electrons as we form the zinc 2 plus ion, and copper 2 plus goes to copper 0. So in that case, we'll get more energy because we're transferring two electrons rather than one. So we need to think about the number of electrons as well as this potential in order to get out the free energy. So to transfer the free energy, uh, our next uh, point is that we can convert we want to find delta G, again, in terms of kilojoules per mole. So kilojoules per mole. And then so to do that, then we have this equation, which is delta G is going to be equal to negative N F E cell. So in this case, E cell, which I'll do in green. So E cell is our cell potential. So this is from, again, our balanced electrochemical reaction. And then this is going to be expressed in terms of volts, which remember is joules per coulomb. So this is going to be how much energy we get out per charge that's being passed. Coulomb is a unit of charge. And then so if you remember, uh, back to um, our original zinc 2 plus and copper 2 plus uh, cell here. So we had again our zinc electrode and a beaker of zinc 2 plus ions. And we had our copper electrode over here and the copper 2 plus ions and charges being transferred from the zinc 
over here to there. And then, so that, that was our balanced chemical reaction. And I said that this could power a light bulb. Uh, but we could also think about pulling on, over here, we have this voltmeter. Oops, let me see if I can circle this. Yes, there's our voltmeter. And so this voltmeter is reading 1.103 volts. So that's overall our cell potential. So this is for every certain coulomb of charge, we're getting that number of joules out in terms of energy. So this is what E cell means. Let me erase that. OK, so that's our cell potential. And then so this is different for every cell. So for every chemical reaction and for under certain conditions, we are at a certain cell potential. And then we have this in volts. So this is our kind of our y-axis for what's going on here. But then we still need to, in order to convert this to energy units, we need to know how many coulombs of charge are being passed. So that's where the negative NF comes in. So this again, how much charge? And again, the cell potential is energy per charge. So in this case, N is the number of moles of electrons, moles of electrons being passed. And so this, again, comes from our balanced electrochemical reaction. So for, again, back to this cell, here we have, again, zinc 2 plus, oops, zinc, zinc metal going to zinc 2 plus, and copper metal going to copper 2 plus over here. So overall, in this case, Again, our balanced reaction is zinc solid plus copper 2 plus going to zinc 2 plus plus copper metal. So here we're passing two electrons per every mole of, I guess, reaction that's going. And so in this case, n equals 2. Great. So, and then finally, we want to convert from moles of electrons to coulombs in order to cancel out these units. So overall, then we have Faraday's constant. This is called the Faraday constant. And then this is, uh, let me get this right, 9, 6, we're around to 500, 9, 6, 500 coulombs of charge per mole of electron. And the way this was calculated was just this was going to be equal to charge of electron per electron times Avogadro's number. And that should give us 96,500 coulombs per mole. So overall, we can then use this. So we get this from our, from balancing our redox reaction. And then this is a constant. And then so all we need to know is E cell, and then we can get out the energy. So let me erase this part. Ooh. So for a reaction to be spontaneous, keep in mind that delta G has to be less than 0. So therefore, a negative NFE is less than 0. Since the number of moles of electrons is always positive, Faraday's constant is always positive, we must, for a reaction to be spontaneous, E cell must be greater than 0 for it to be spontaneous. If E cell is less than zero, it's going to be non-spontaneous. Okay, and then one last thing is, um, like I said, that delta G and E cell will be changed for every different reaction and can change under different conditions. So often what you, you want to know and what you can read off of table is going to be called the standard of cell potential and then the standard free energy. So in this case, Delta G naught equals negative N F E naught cell. So again, this is kind of the key takeaway of this entire lecture. You must know this equation. And then so for this, what this not means, the standard conditions, we're talking about standard T, T pressure, you know, one bar, and then 
what's key for often we'll do our electrochemistry on solutions of ions or other compounds. So for solutions, the standard conditions are one molar. Um, so if you have uh, different than one molar, your cell potential will change. Those not be under standard conditions. And we'll talk about the effects of this uh, in the following lecture. Okay. And then one last thing is, we'll just do an example of calculating delta G. So if we think about that reaction that we talked about last time, which was if we have this cell, so we use a carbon electrode, and then we are oxidizing aqueous iodide to I2. And then we have, uh, so this is again our anodic reactions getting oxidized. And then we have permanganate Mn2 plus. So these are both aqueous and protons aqueous with our carbon electrode. So this E cell, if we just took these beakers under standard conditions, one molar of everything, so iodine is solid, so it's pure, not one molar, but let's say one molar of this, one molar, one molar, one molar, one molar. So our ions, our iodide, permanganate, manganese 2, and protons, those are our standard conditions. We then hook up a voltmeter to this. And then uh, for everything, our E cell will be, uh, in this case, going to be, sorry, let me read this off. It's approximately 1 volt. So this is greater than, okay, it's an approximate sign. So this is greater than 0. So overall, this reaction will be spontaneous. And therefore, this can go. If we tried to hook it up the reverse way, where we took manganese 2 plus, oxide is permanganate, and then use I2 and reduce that to iodide, our E cell would then be negative 1 volts, and that would be very spontaneous. So again, we want a very positive E cell, and then that way our overall reaction, this iodide going to I2, permanganate going to manganese 2 plus, that will proceed. And that way we can get out electrical, electrical work out of that. So that is cell potentials, and we'll talk a little bit more about where they come from and the use that we can make of cell potentials in the following video.